Welcome to the 15th episode of Rybana Review, a program of stories, features, and book reviews. My name is Robert Boucheron. I will be your host for a half hour of reading aloud with illustrations. The print magazine, Rybana Review, is published four times a year in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the Rybana River. The magazine is available in bookstores on the Main Street Mall in Charlottesville and other bookstores in Virginia. You can order a copy or a subscription from the website, rybanareview.com. Contributors live all over the world and they write about places far and wide. Book reviews are small press titles and authors you may not know about. This episode is all news from Habsburg, a picturesque town in the Shenandoah Valley. We will read four squibs from The Vindicator, the weekly newspaper, and the story Shady Grove about Harriet Thigpen. Merger mooted. Since hitting a peak around 1960, membership in mainstream Christian churches has steadily declined. Huddled under soaring arches and stained glass windows in grand structures that are costly to maintain, the faithful are old now, bowed under the weight of years. As children, they went to Sunday school in the education wing built next door in the post-war boom. Irene Hamber remembers. The crush on holidays, the parking problems, the stifling air, the endless announcements, the rumble of the organ, the voice from the pulpit that echoed inside your skull. So what if Sunday service was boring? A little suffering made you a better person. The education wing is empty now. Religious fervor remains strong, but the birth rate has dropped and a number of people in the pews find it hard to pay the bills. Who will replace them to carry on the tradition? People who never went to church as children don't see the point. In big cities, churches have disbanded and sold their buildings. Will it happen here? Two local congregations have faced the music. Brick Front United Methodist Church and Ebenezer Chapel AME are pondering the first tentative step toward a merger. Reverend Abner Wright of Ebenezer says, Given our history, you might call it a reunification. The African Methodist Episcopal Church was founded in 1816 in Philadelphia as a split from the Methodists over racial discrimination. After the Civil War, local residents started the Ebenezer Chapel for ex-slaves and colored people. It developed as an important center for John Henry Town, the black community of Habsburg. Here we are, 150 years later, still meeting in separate corners, weak and divided. Some of us think we could be stronger together. Pastor Ed Zwiebeck of Brickfront agrees. He notes that segregation in the South is no longer a matter of law, and black people have made social and economic progress, but old attitudes persist. Racism is alive and well in Virginia, he says. That should come as news to no one. But Christians have a sacred obligation to overcome injustice. What better way than to share worship of the Almighty? No one should see this as a hostile takeover. At this early stage, it is unclear which congregation will absorb the other. Possibly they will reconstitute under a new name. What to do with a surplus church? The newly formed Quidnunc Islamic Center is raising funds and scouting property. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Stained glass and sculpture pose an issue, but QIC pledges to respect historic architecture. Will Methodist turn to mosque? The deal is far from done, Wright says. We are talking and praying for guidance. Library Book Sale. The annual used book sale to benefit the public library attracts a swarm of eager buyers from near and far. This year, to accommodate thousands of books and visitors, the sale was moved to a vacant mill floor in the defunct Habsburg Ironworks. Folding tables and pine shelves occupied the bare space lit by banks of windows. The old mill is not heated or cooled. Given the crush of people and the mild October weather, windows were propped open for a breath of fresh air. Now and then, a small bird flew in one side and out the other. Milton Deckel, who owns the book nook off Main Street, closed his shop for the week to organize the sale and supervise volunteers. In return for coordinating the event, Deckel was allowed first pick. 
He says, the shop is already small and full, so I only take a few dozen books. When it began, the sale had books removed from the library collection to make room for new titles. No one checked the books out for years, or they were duplicates or outdated guides and reference books. The event has grown in size since then. Most of what's here was donated by residents for the sale. Except for literary tourists, the shoppers are the same people who donated the books. Given the recycle aspect, do some of the same books turn up year after year? Deckel says, it's possible. As you can see, there are no recent titles. Almost everything is decades old, probably read more than once. Habsburg is too small to support a chain bookstore like Barnes & Noble, so what we depend on filters in from the outside world, and local taste is conservative. 19th century novels are popular, Shakespeare and the Romantic poets, and big guns like James Michener and Irving Stone. If fiction is the main draw, other tables are loaded with books on cooking, gardening, hiking, horseback riding, nature, pets, quilting, social science, and travel. Deckel notes trends. Military history and the Civil War are less popular than they used to be. Agricultural titles like How to Raise Chickens, Diseases of Cattle, Grafting Fruit Trees, those have nearly disappeared. One category that's still strong is religion and spirituality. Deckel gestures to a large table thronged with quiet browsers. Ladies hoist shopping bags and roll little carts. In hushed tones, two gentlemen debate a theological point. People in the Shenandoah are bi biblically literate, and they love to read commentaries. You hear them quote chapter and verse. No one tries to convert anyone. It's more like a competitive sport. Variegated Gutter Snipe On a lovely spring afternoon, as Floyd Puffenbarger ate an apple on his front porch, a white pickup parked on the street about 50 yards away. Two men emerged wearing white polo shirts. An embroidered logo on the chest resembled a map of Virginia. One man had a clipboard, the other a flashlight. Puffenbarger swallowed the mouthful of apple he was chewing. I am Harlan Kozener, an inspector from the State Agricultural Extension. We are looking for infestations of the variegated gutter snipe, an invasive species of beetle. Have you seen one? Clipped to the clipboard was a color photograph at blown up scale. The beetle had a mottled shell with patches of red, black, and yellow. I have not seen one, Puffenbarger said. We couldn't help but notice the large Alanthus in your backyard. Alanthus is an invasive species. Yes, we know. It is often a host for the beetle. And it isn't in my backyard. It's on the property line, mostly next door. Your yard has better access. Can we walk in for a closer look? Knock yourselves out. Puffenbarger took another bite of apple and followed the two inspectors. They inspected the Alanthus, which was tall and graceful. Poison ivy grew up the trunk, a furred vine with grassy leaves in groups of three. Alanthus suckers sprout in my backyard all summer, Puffenbarger said. I yank them, but the roots live on. The sucker sap has a pungent smell that's hard to wash off, like wild onions. I yank those too, but it's a losing battle. Is there a bug that eats poison ivy? Not that I know of, Kozener said. Goats will eat anything. The flashlight was no help in broad daylight. The inspectors did not find any beetles, eggs, cocoons, patches of withered bark, or misshapen leaves. Disappointed on the way out, they gave Puffenbarger a flyer about exotic pests. The flyer asked him to be on the lookout for the blue-nosed gopher, flying squirrel, spotted dick, and variegated gutter snipe. Thank you for your cooperation, Kozener said. Puffenbarger dropped his apple core behind an azalea. Perpetual Care Rose Hill Cemetery occupies a low ridge south of town along Quickwid Creek. Once a pasture, the thin stony soil was good for little else. In the early 20th century, as churchyards like St. Giles Episcopal and Lane Presbyterian filled up, a private group of investors bought several acres, laid out burial plots on winding paths, planted roses, pines, and evergreen clumps, and opened the first non-denominational cemetery in Habsburg. 
With its up-to-date plan, inspired by garden suburbs of the period, Rose Hill offered a range of options, full sun, partial shade, family compounds for up to a dozen individual plots, and a guaranteed landscape maintenance program called Perpetual Care. A hundred years later, the paths wind through a varied panorama of gnarled old roses, brooding pines, and impenetrable thickets. What had been a barren ridge is now a picturesque spot, ideal for lonely walks and quiet contemplation. Burial customs continue to change, and attitudes toward the dead evolve. Since most of the original layout is developed, Rose Hill has announced a new addition for a new generation. The resident manager, Daryl Gross, a state-licensed cemeterian, leads a party on a tour of the meadow. As you see, it's low-lying ground actually in the floodplain of the creek. We decided to limit the meadow to cremation burials, which are more popular, and to keep it all natural. No headstones, no fences, no paved roads, and no artificial flowers allowed. Grave markers will be small and flush with the grass. This makes the job of mowing easier, and it preserves the natural beauty of the land. That's important to people today. When they visit a deceased loved one, or when they choose a final resting place for themselves, they want to support the environment like always. Shady Grove. Harriet Thigpen got by for 72 years on personal charm and a perfect memory. She could recall the weather on a day in the past, recipes to feed a family that was gone, telephone numbers no longer in use, addresses of persons who died years ago, and passages from books that nobody reads today. She used her gift to surprise people. Life was not hard, but Harriet toiled and suffered her share. She raised three children and married two husbands. Before marriage, she worked for a company that published almanacs, directories, and one-volume reference books. The job suited a mind such as hers, but for all her tact, she irritated co-workers. In a disagreement over a matter of fact, Harriet was always right. The second husband, Carl Thigpen, left her a comfortable house in Habsburg, Virginia, a secure income, and a web of family relationships. The youngest daughter lived nearby. Helen was married to attorney Sam Dobbin with children. They respected Harriet's privacy, which meant she passed much of her time alone. Harriet had no schedule to keep, no responsibilities. Her health was excellent. She smiled at strangers. Alone, she hummed a popular song or an old hymn tune. Lately, in the course of a day, there were gaps she could not account for. She shrugged them off. At this point, what did it matter if she lost an hour here and there? In a smart print dress with coordinated hat and handbag, Harriet went for an afternoon walk. She had no destination, the spring weather was fine, and the streets of the upscale neighborhood were safe. The rhythm of motion and the balmy air led her to wander. A police officer on a patrol spotted Harriet on the bank. He pulled the cruiser to the side of the street, left the lights flashing, and approached on foot. A large man in a dark blue uniform, he called out, Ma'am? Why, officer, what a pleasant surprise! Harriet smiled warmly and extended her hand as though at her reception. Do I know you? No, ma'am, Norman Coles. Are you all right? Never felt better in my life, and you? I'm just fine, ma'am. He grasped her firmly by the elbow and guided her toward the cruiser. This is a risky place to walk, ma'am. Do you know where you are? Of course I do, she said indignantly, then gazed at her surroundings with interest. A river of cars rushed below. The highway cut. Goodness, how those azaleas have lasted. How did I get here? That's what I'm asking you, ma'am. I must have walked here on my own two feet. I want to take you home now. Do you live with relatives? No, I'm all alone in the world. If not strictly true, this statement struck the right note. Can you tell me where you live? Harriet automatically gave her address. As they drove to the large Tudor-style house, Coles radioed the station. The dispatcher told him to stay with the wanderer until a family member or friend could be located. Once home, Harriet treated Officer Coles as a gentleman caller. 
Sam David found them seated in the living room, conversing. On a coaster before the officer was a glass of iced tea, untouched. Next to it, his service cap lay upside down. He stood as the man in the dark suit entered. Must you go so soon? Harriet chimed. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to drag you into this, Sam Dobbin, attorney. The men shook hands. All in the line of duty, sir. Good day, ma'am. Officer Coles slipped his hat under his arm and exited. Sam took the patrolman's place on the sofa. Harriet, tell me what happened. Nothing, Sam, absolutely nothing. I went out for a stroll, which I often do, you know. It's good exercise in the spring weather is delightful. That nice police officer stopped and picked me up. She giggled. How long were you out? I don't know. I lost my way. It may have been an hour. You covered a good three miles. I must have had one of my spells. Spells? Like sleepwalking, but I'm wide awake. So this wasn't the first time. No, but the first time in public, requiring police intervention. Harriet's gaiety faded and she turned to face her son-in-law. Well, Sam, what shall we do with me? For the moment, nothing. That is, if you're all right. Yes, she took an inventory. Physically, I'm all here. Let me talk to Helen. I'll ask her to call you tonight after supper. He glanced at his watch. You must get back to the office. I'm a bother and not even your own flesh and blood. Harriet, stop. If you need anything, call us, either one. We'll talk to you tonight. With a phone call to Helen's sister in Minnesota, the family council convened. Their half-brother was in a sailboat somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, cut off from communication. Harriet should not be left alone all the time, Helen began. You can't take me in, she said to the Dobbins. You have enough to do as it is. We could hire a home's health aid, Sam said. I'm not that far gone. What about a companion, asked Constance. The speakerphone made her voice sound tinny and irrelevant. That sounds nice, Harriet said, but are educated young women of good reputation still available for a pittance? Why don't we ask Theodore Percy, Helen said. Harriet is a member of St. Giles. Maybe he will have an idea. The next day, Sam phoned the rector of St. Giles Episcopal Church, a respected and well-loved figure. He responded with sympathy. How is she? I have missed seeing her at church. Her physical health is good. Her mind is sharp except for the spells. I am a trustee of the Shady Grove Rest Home, Percy said. Let's invite Harriet to lunch there. The residence lending library is in need of a volunteer coordinator. She's bound to know what's afoot. A dignified pretext. At Harriet's age, though we seldom admit it, we contemplate the end. Shady Grove is one step closer. They set a date for the lunch. Harriet was not the least bit deceived. My research skills are outdated. How much would they benefit the lending library? Consider it a social occasion. I look forward to it then. Late one morning, another fresh spring day, Sam and Helen fetched Harriet in their car. Harriet wore the same print dress as on the day she was apprehended. It was new after all. As they looped up the drive to the main entrance, Theodore Percy and Dr. Etheridge Voles, the director of Shady Grove, stood in the neoclassical porch. A large, florid man with a curly beard, Dr. Voles wore a plaid suit and a fawn-colored vest with a gold watch chain. He beamed and chuckled as though life were a continual feast. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Father Percy arrived this very minute. Mr. Dobbin, Mrs. Dobbin, he seized their hands. And Mrs. Thigpen, what a lovely dress. Greetings were exchanged all around with remarks on the fine weather. Harriet was intrigued by the house, a mansion converted to its current use. On the fascia over the columns, a motto was inscribed. Deus nobis haec otia fecit, she read aloud. Virgil, isn't it? The bucolics, a god has made this leisure for us, or just God. Really, Mrs. Thigpen, said Dr. Voles, you're the first person to identify that tag on the spot. Are you a classical scholar? Oh, no. How did you manage? I attended college, Dr. Voles. 
No doubt it dates from the time this was the Lockhorn estate, said Father Percy, quite apt even now. Back then, a dash of Latin was taken for granted among the Virginia gentry. A spry, white-haired man, evidently a resident, emerged from the shrubbery. Fortunate Senex, Harriet said gaily with a wave of the hand. Startled, the old man passed without a word. Oh, lucky old man, Harriet translated. It's from the same poem, two shepherds meet in the country outside Rome and... You're just the person we need to organize our library, Dr. Vogels said. Won't you come in and have a look? Like a potentate receiving an honored guest, Dr. Vogels offered his arm to Harriet and escorted her inside. The Dobbins followed, and Percy brought up the rear. Harriet inspected the former parlor with its fine woodwork and heart pine floor. The old drapes remained, as well as a brown leather sofa. Sprinkler pipes hung from the ceiling, spoiling the effect. Shelves carried a hodgepodge of books donated by the res residents. More books lay in random stacks and cardboard boxes on the floor. A wooden card catalog salvaged from a school stood in a corner like a child being punished. The party progressed to the administrative office once the morning room. They saw the vast game room equipped with billiards, ping pong, and cards. The card table had a jigsaw puzzle spread on top. They peeked in the lounge with its massive stone fireplace. Through glass doors, they glimpsed the terrace, paved with marble tiles and decorated with urns. The tour ended at the dining room, where residents gathered at the double sliding door, like famished souls in the underworld, Harriet thought. The white-haired man they had flushed from the shrubbery led the pack. Jovial Dr. Vowles greeted them by name. Mrs. Drake, Mr. Wentworth, Mr. McLeod, Miss Arrington, and Mr. Greenleaf with your nose in the door as usual. The grandfather clock in the hall struck noon. The double door parted and the crowd surged forward. Several small tables filled the large room. Dr. Vowles guided his party to one in the middle, set with a white cloth, china, silver, and a glass vase of cut flowers. From our own gardens, he said, many of our residents are avid gardeners. We encourage them to pursue the activities they have always enjoyed. A waitress appeared with menus, each a single page, headed by the date. She wore an old-fashioned costume of black and white, like a serving maid, and a name pin, Selena. The selections vary from day to day, Dr. Bowles said. There are alternates for those with special dietary needs. Do you see anything to tempt your appetite? Selena hovered nearby, ready to take their orders. Dr. Bowles offered suggestions, asked questions, and facilitated decisions. With a ready supply of anecdotes, he made sure the talk was lively. Selena reappeared with a tray, and the table was laden with good things. The Dobbins gazed around the room in wonder. A chandelier hung from a ceiling adorned with plaster gardens of fruit. Harriet was animated and gracious. She flirted with Dr. Voles, who gamely returned the compliment. As Selida brought coffee, Harriet opened her arms to include the table or perhaps the whole room. When can I move in? We will be delighted to have you join our merry band, Dr. Wolves said, as soon as there is a vacancy. As a trustee, said Father Percy, I see nothing to stand in the way of your acceptance as a new resident. The application is pro forma. We can look into the financial side, said Sam Dobbin, which will include selling the house. Are you sure you're ready for this, Mother? asked Helen. Yes, dear, as sure as I can be. I'm tired of living alone, tired of living in the past. Did you bring me here to organize a library when I'm losing my mind? Dr. Voles let someone else take the question. As no one did, it hung in the air. The vacancy appeared, the house was sold, and a date was set for the move to Shady Grove. Sam Dobbin did all the legal and financial. Harriet hoped he collected a fee for his effort, but it seemed indelicate to ask. Besides, it all happened in a rush. Hardly was the decision made when it became a reality. No time for regret. Her life was no longer in her own hands, but in those of an inexorable fate. Movers came at the end of August. Much of the furniture went into storage. Grandchildren would divide it at some uncertain date. 
Harriet's private room could accommodate a few pieces, Helen helped her choose a bed, a bureau, and a small desk. She rejected a rocking chair as too old ladylike. They settled on a French armchair, upholstered in tapestry. Harriet never cared much for furniture, so it was no great loss. Still, she wondered, torn from familiar surroundings, with objects and pictures to jog her memory, would she forget more and more? As it was, her two husbands blurred together. She caught herself skipping over the second and attributing everything to the first. The spells seemed to be getting no worse, but how could she tell? She was jumping off a cliff and expecting a breeze to waft her to safety. Alone in the empty house, Harriet perched on a windowsill and traced a finger on the dusty glass. Denued of carpets, curtains, and sofas, the house was dirty. How could she have lived like this? The air was hot and damp. The power was turned off. With people away on vacation, August seemed more final than December, more of an end to things. Dead in the water, her sailor son would say. Harriet groped in her handbag for a cigarette. She found things in it that couldn't be hers. Then she remembered that she and Alan had quit smoking years ago. Or was it Carl? Sam Dobbin was busy that day, and Harriet had the children to manage. Theodore Percy would drive Harriet to Shady Grove. Years ago, when she arrived at St. Giles as a young priest, he was eager to win souls and carve a niche for himself. He grew in stature while Harriet shrank from a busy mother to an irresponsible waif. At last, the, direct, the rector strode through the front door, a trim man of 60 clad in black with a plume of snow-white hair. Father Percy, she cried impulsively, into thy hands I commend my spirit. <laughs>